In this episode, Pages of History, Kalkan Gaul, the first time that fighters used rocket-powered projectiles, tank triathlon, wheeled tanks against the most impassable dirt, and metal beasts, the long-awaited American supersonic fighter. Meet the fastest aircraft in the game so far, the supersonic North American F-100D Super Sabre at BR 9.7. It looks quite striking, a swept wing, a high rudder, an elongated fuselage. This plane is big. It's powered by the amazing Pratt & Whitney engine, which is fueled from, well, everywhere. The engineers placed the protected fuel tanks in the wings and near the engine. And in the front, under the pilot, there are four 20mm cannons with a shared payload of 800 bullets. The Super Sabre sets a new standard for the fast gameplay in air battles. This machine can speed up to a mind-blowing 1458 kph in horizontal flight at 10 km altitude. Keep in mind, it weighs 10 tons on its own and carries an additional 5 tons of payload. Still, the huge weight matters. The aircraft's climb rate is a bit lower than 80 meters per second, which is almost twice as slow as the MiG-19, its Soviet rival. And it takes the whole 40 seconds to turn, also thanks to the mass of the plane. So. How does the Super Sabre compensate for its tardiness, if such a word is even applicable to a supersonic jet? Well, firstly, it's got air brakes and great wing mechanization. Secondly, it has a whole arsenal of various underwing options, four types of bombs from 500 to 1,000 pounds, two types of rockets, the guided bullpups and the unguided Hydra 70. Combinations of bombs and rockets and four air-to-air -air missiles, the newest ones added in Update Supersonic. Technically, it's a fighter, but some strikers would envy those payload options. So, how do you play on the F-100D? Depending on the game mode, we can recommend one of two tactical choices. In combined battles, your striking potential can be realized at its fullest. Take, say, four 750-pound bombs and two bullpup rockets. The primary targets for you will be the enemy aviation, especially the helicopters. And when you've cleared the skies, the ground enemies will get what they deserved. Destroy the SPAAGs with your guided rockets, and the bombs are for everyone else below you. But be careful. It's very easy to feel invincible at supersonic speeds and make foolish mistakes because of it. The second option is for those who go to air battles. Here, your employee is called the elusive fighter. You don't need any payload except for sidewinders. All of the rest depends on your forward-faced cannons. Use them to attack the opponents on collision courses as you've got a 10 kilogram one second burst that should blow anyone to pieces. When the match starts, set a slight climb angle and speed up until it doesn't speed up anymore. Sure, the opponents will be higher by the time you reach them, but who's able to catch you anyway? The enemies will have to launch their missiles and all you've got to do is evade them and go about your business. Preferably, you'll also need to abstain from dogfights. The plane can quickly lose its speed right until it stalls, which leads it to literally hanging in the air for a couple of seconds. And a static object in the clear skies is a perfect target for any subsonic aircraft. Overall, the Super Sabre is quite universal. It can handle both enemy aviation and ground targets. It's not very climby and maneuverable, true, but all of it's greatly compensated by its vast choice of payload options. In 
It's the summer of 1939. Halchen Gol. What do we have here? Ah, nothing special. Just a local border incident. There are lots of these happening here and there. Every pair of eyes in the world is fixed on Europe, where all the fun is starting, and nobody cares about what's going on in the middle of nowhere amid some Asian desert. Meanwhile, the casualties on both sides of the conflict are numbered in thousands. Tanks, trucks, armored vehicles, artillery of all calibers shooting day and night, and air battles, ones that nobody has ever seen before. At times, there were hundreds of fighters and bombers in the air at the same time. The stakes were as high as they could possibly be. The Imperial Japanese Army Air Force armed their best aces with the most modern tech they had. The USSR did the same thing. Firstly, the odds were in Japan's favor. Its army advanced to Mongolia and established its presence there. The skies were also under the control of their pilots. They were numerous. Their Ki-27 fighters were more maneuverable, they were closer to home, and easier to support and maintain. And even the communications were better than the Soviet ones. But the all-out attack they'd planned for August the 24th still never happened. On August 20th at 4.15 a.m., the joint forces of the USSR and Mongolia attacked them first. For the first couple of hours, the Japanese pilots considered it a show of despair. Once again, they took off on hundreds of fighters and the newest Ki-21 bombers and set out to bomb the Soviet tanks and Mongolian cavalry. And then, all hell broke loose. The first reports coming to Japanese army headquarters consisted of panic shouts and very confusing data. The Soviet fighters seemed to use some new weapon, something nobody had ever seen, and it literally tore the Japanese fighters apart right in the air. Captain Zvonaryov's wing of the I-16s gave a single blast at a group of Japanese fighters and destroyed two of the Ki-27s from a kilometer away. The rest of them retreated in panic. An hour later, the same happened to two Ki-21 bombers flying in another big formation. The more they attacked, the worse it became. The Japanese command found out that the new weapon was only installed on the I-16s with white circles on their fuselages and gave the order to evade contact with those at all costs. Next day, every Soviet and Mongolia I-16 showed up to battle with a white circle on it, and the disciplined Japanese pilots were running away as fast as they could. This was the first time the Soviet Air Force used the newest weapon, the RS-82 rockets. The Japanese officers, trying to guess what the hell that was, decided that the Russians somehow managed to equip their fighters with 76mm cannons and demanded the same thing for their own fighters. Only a half a year later, they got word from the German spies that those were rocket-powered projectiles, and it was the first time in history when an aircraft used those against another aircraft. But it became clear long after it was all over. Still, they could have guessed it themselves. As early as in 1916, the French Air Force tried to do the same thing when fighting against Zeppelins and Aerostats. Not to mention the Chinese experiment over their long and interesting history. We continued testing tech from different countries in our tank triathlon. Today, we'll see what to expect from wheeled tanks. The American crew is using the T-18E2. The Germans decided to ride on the Puma. The Soviet command sent out the BTR-150A, the British crew picked the AEC Mark II, and the Italians chose the R3 T-20 FAHS. Gosh, who was in charge of naming the Italian tech? As always, we start with the obstacle course. Ready, set, go! The Italian machine darts off to victory. 
The German Puma isn't very keen on losing either. The rest of the tanks compete against each other. Now, the contestants traverse the dirt roads of Kursk. The leaders keep speeding up, and we've got an outsider, the T-18E2. Finish line on the highway. The Germans continue the battle for first place with the Italians, and the Italian tank leaves the Puma behind and gets the prize for this round. The Puma is the second, third place goes to the BTR-150A, and the last place goes to the British crew that lost to the Americans this time. Next trial, the shooting range. Every contestant needs to shoot two targets, one light armored and another one a bit sturdier. The machines take their positions. Three, two, one, fire! Great piercing and reload rates provide for the German leadership this time. And they weren't even using the premium version of the Puma. Behind it are the British and the Americans, and their sharpshooting is remarkable. As for the Soviets and the Italian machines, well, they couldn't even pierce the armored target. And the final trial, shooting on the move. Wheeled tanks aren't supposed to stand still, are they? That's right. And neither will the target be just standing there. Ready, set, go! It seems that the T-18E2 has some problems with driving from its cover. The best start is once again performed by the Puma, thanks to as much as six reverse gears. The rest of the contestants get to work as well. And now everybody is trying to make as many new holes in their targets as possible, and faster than the others. Looks like we've got a leader of this challenge. And it's the American machine that has a great stabilized weapon. Next to finish the job is the British tank with the shoulder pad. The other tanks missed a lot of their shots and lost a lot of points for that matter. Time to sum it up. Third place goes to the British AEC Mark II, a machine that represents the word balance in every way. Second place is awarded to the contestant from Italy. It has amazing speed parameters, great passability, and a fast weapon, even though it can't handle a protected target. As for the winner, it is obviously the German Puma that was great in both the marathon and the shooting range. Uh, meanwhile, there are a couple of other modern wheel tanks on the field, the French AMX-10RC and the Italian Centauro. It wouldn't be fair to make them compete against uh, World War II tech, but nevertheless, let's give them an opportunity to prove themselves as well. Here we go. The passability of both tanks is amazing. It's hard to find any terrain that would stall them in the slightest. Next, the water hazard. Wait. Now, there's something wrong here. Yeah, out of two machines, only the AMX-10RC can swim. It also has a great variable hydro-pneumatic suspension, but the Italian tank has weapon stabilizer, giving the Centauro an advantage in shooting. We won't be awarding any prizes here, but in time, if these machines get more rivals to compete against, we'll make a separate video about that. And now, it's time to answer your questions. The first question today is sent by a player called Sebastian. Do you actually need a license to be able to put some vehicles into the game? Like racing games have it with car brands? Hi there. Thank you for this interesting question. Of course, in most cases we do need a license, and it doesn't matter if the tech is a civilian or military one. Behind it, there are always its creators. They own the rights for the machines, and in every case, one has to negotiate the terms of using their intellectual property for one's needs. So, every model presented in the game wasn't just created by our designers and modelers. It also is a product of our lawyer's work. Then, there is a question from Joris van Hoymen. For the time triathlon, I would wish to see points they got for each round. 
This would make it more clear who won. Hi there. The decision behind those wins is made by the editorial staff of the shooting range and some of the top-tier players working with us. We divide the points without relying solely on the numbers. We consider the overall balance of the vehicle as well. In other words, we highly doubt that the results have to be scaled down to simple statistical sum-ups. Yoga AR asks, Ah, the horns for tank and the ships, please. Hi there, Yoga AR. Well, historically, some of the tanks did have some horns, or more often, sirens. But if the tank commander would start meddling with those in the middle of the fight, the troop commander would cuff him so hard he'd forget where those siren controls are located. And should we introduce such an option, what would stop you, the players, honking all the time in the game? That's right, <laughs> nothing. The game that we're carefully making as realistic and atmospheric as we can would turn into a mess where everyone just drives around and hoots all the time. What's next? Tanks with a separate button for jumping? Next, there's a question from Timak TR. Could you organize an in-game tank biathlon competition like they do in the game? Hi there. Thanks for the question. We're pleased that the new section of the show has got you all interested. As for an in-game realization, the triathlon is not suitable to determine who's best at driving or shooting. The most important things here are passability, speed, and firepower of a given tech, and not its driver's qualifications. We could as well have called it an International War Thunder Manufacturers Championship. Having said that, we'll get this idea to the development team, but of course, no promises there. And the last question is asked by Effie Kaplan. Do you think to do anything in this April Fool's Gaijin? Of course we do. We're already devising some cunning plans while grinning in the tragic red lights. But we'll try to keep this as a secret, so you'll have to wait and see for yourself. Well, that's it for today. This was The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Subscribe to the channel to be the first to watch the next episodes of the renewed Shooting Range. Click the bell, like, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. See you in a week.